Uh, I'm continuing my series now on books of the Bible, so turn to Philemon, a little book, just one chapter. We're continuing our helicopter ride over the Bible, looking at the mountain peaks of God's historical plan. And this little book of Philemon is very interesting and very important, even though it's short. We're going to read a few verses in this book, starting in chapter, of course there's only one chapter, but verse 10 of Philemon. Verse 10 comes before Hebrews, comes after Titus. Paul writing to Philemon says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. There's something just a little, as much as I appreciate it, just something a little strange in a way for me, personally getting recognition as I have been today, and my wife, when... There's so many people here who make this ministry possible. If you would come in during the week, you would see people doing things without this kind of recognition and attention. And so I and my wife could not do this without your prayers, without your work, without your support. I'm only the voice. You're the heart. The heart is here. I'm just the voice. And we speak for the Lord whenever we get a chance. We use every opportunity to get the Word of God out to our community and to the world. And God has a great future for our church. Philemon was a prominent member of the church at Colossae. You remember Paul wrote a letter to the church of the Colossians. And we know some things about Philemon. For one thing, he was a well-to-do man. Not many people had the kind of house, probably, that he had. He had a large house, which he opened up for worship. I wonder how many of you have ever had a worship service in your home. Have you ever had any at all? Have you ever... Invited any neighbors in for a prayer meeting? Have you ever had a Bible study in your home? That's something to think about. You might be able to have a ministry and an outreach in that way. But in the second verse of this little epistle, Paul refers to the church in your house. Of course, back in Bible days, they didn't have the big cathedrals and big buildings. So that's something to keep in mind. The church is not the building. It's not a large cathedral or a small chapel on the hill. It's the people who gather. Church means called out assembly. All right. He was a slave owner. The Romans had slaves. Many of these were people who had been conquered in foreign nations and were brought into their homes. And they were often intelligent, educated people and were given the responsibility of teaching their children and doing such things maybe as uh, architectural work or perhaps engineering in that day. And Philemon had a slave named Onesimus. And apparently Onesimus was not faithful to his master. 
And so he stole some of his property from what we gather in this book and escaped and went on the lamb. And Onesimus ran away to Rome. We're in that great metropolis. We're in that teeming city of thousands of people. He disappeared into the crowd. But something wonderful happened to Onesimus while he was in Rome. He came in contact with Paul the Apostle. And Paul led him to the Lord. He became a Christian. He was changed. He got saved, as we would say today. And Paul took him under his wing. He became a beloved brother. He became a son to Paul. And you know, when you, when you lead someone to the Lord, when you have a part in nurturing someone, or when you have a part in uh, leading someone to Christ, and then teaching that person, whether it's a child or someone else, they become like children to you. And you love them. Just like a pastor loves his flock. They're his spiritual children. Many of you have been saved through the, the efforts of this poor preacher. And your sons and, and children. And so Paul loved Onesimus, but Paul knew that there was a debt to pay. There was a score to settle. And so Paul said to Onesimus, I'm going to send you back to your master. I want to send you back with a message from me. I want you to take care of this debt that you owe him. As a matter of fact, I want to pay it myself. And I want you to apologize for what you've done, for being a thief. And so he sends him back with this letter written in a very tender way, in a very emotional way, really, and pleads with his friend Philemon, this wealthy Christian in the church at Colossia, to forgive him and to take him back. And so that's what this letter is all about. Now, let's see if we can draw from this story some lessons for us today. This is the Bible. The Bible is a living book. The Bible is not something encased in history that's written on stone 2,000 years ago. It applies to our daily lives today because although times have changed, nations have changed, customs change, culture changes, people are basically the same. We're all sinners, just like they were then, and we all need the Lord Jesus Christ. We have families, just like they did then. They were citizens of governments, just like we are today. And there are all these instructions on how we're to be good husbands and wives and how we're to be good citizens, how we're to be good Christians, how we are to start churches and the whole ball of wax. And speaking, of course, of families, we, we had a beautiful wedding here yesterday. And a new family was started, Kirk and Ashley. And we need to be praying for them. As a matter of fact, we need to especially pray for all of our young families, the young people who are getting married and are having children, because to bring children into the world in this day and age is quite a challenge, but also it's a great blessing. All right, let's see if we can find some Lessons from the book of Philemon. And the first one, one is the lesson of hospitality. And we need to talk a little bit about that today because I'm not sure that any of us are as good at it maybe as we should be. And I know that some are better than others. And I, I don't think I need to mention any names here. But some of you folk, bless your hearts, have just been so gracious about inviting folk into your home and having folk come under your table and sit there and eat. There's just something beautiful. There's something wonderful about fellowship inside of a home. And I know that in the past, some of these home meetings have done much toward healing misunderstandings in the church and your love. And again, I don't need to mention any names. You know who they are. 
but then maybe some of the rest of us, and maybe I'm, I've done that some, but, you know, really, maybe some of you have never done it. Now, I'm not fussing at you. I could, but I won't. I'll just get up and encourage you to use your home for the Lord. And not just, by the way, for other Christians, but for the unsaved as well, because although they may not understand your Lord and they may not love your God, they know what kindness is. They know what friendliness is. They know what a good meal is. So use your home to gather in people. So this is about hospitality. Uh, Paul uh, says to Philemon in verse 5 that he was a man who loved people. He says, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Philemon loved people. You're going to be a witness, you've got to love people. Now, that's just all there is to it. You've got to show kindness. And people can tell if your love is real or not. And you know, sometimes we can fake love, we can smile at people, and we can even put our arms around them, but they usually know if we really love them. If you love people, you're willing to sacrifice for them. Jesus said, that he laid down his life for his sheep. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You, you, I'm sure most of you parents, and probably all of you do, you love your children. What would, you would do anything for your children, wouldn't you? I know that. I see how you parents act. You give for them. You, you sacrifice for them. You pray for them. And we... Uh, we parents have the privilege of loving our children, and you children should certainly respond to that with love for your parents. And so he loved the, the people, he loved Jesus, and he loved the saints. He loved the saints of God. He also refreshed the hearts of the saints. That's a good word, isn't it? Refreshment. We need to be refreshed. That's what church is about. That's what prayer meetings are about. That's what Bible studies are about. Being refreshed. I don't know how people can stay away from the house of God. If, if the word's being preached and if there's good singing and testimonies, how can they stay away from the house of the Lord? If, if you're a real believer, I think you're going to love to come and be refreshed in the house of God because as we walk through this world we get tired we get flat we have spiritual fatigue we get worn down you know a, just like a cup of water refreshes your body a good meal refreshes your 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 body I know uh, very often maybe in the late, late afternoon I'll get tired you know and and I've been up all day, maybe studying or, or uh, you know, going out and visiting or doing various things, maybe working in the yard and I'm tired and I come in at, at our usual eating time and there's, my wife has this nice meal and, and I like iced tea and, uh, and I take that and, you know, and I feel refreshed. You need spiritual food. You, you need to be refreshed and so... This man Philemon, when you, was a, when you were around him, he made you refreshed. He, he made you feel better. Have you met people who, well, to be frank with you, you you're around them a little while and you, you just get discouraged because they're always under a cloud. There's always rain coming down when, when you're around them. You know? you know what I mean? Always complaining, always picking at something, always negative but then there are other people they are full of the joy of the Lord. You're refreshed when you're around them. You come away feeling better. They encourage you. You know, I tell you, there have been folk in this church right here, and again, I could mention some names, but I won't. Well, I will, I will mention one name. I remember when Brother Chris Bingham here got sick, and he had a terrible disease, you know, double myeloma. And uh, we, I went into his room one day at the hospital, you know, and he, oh, he, 
I don't know what, he just had this gift of, of encouraging you, you know. Here is a guy, you know, they, they didn't really give him much hope of getting over this cancer. I remember we walked in the hospital up here one day at Evangelical Hospital, and he picked up the phone and said, Well, hello, it's Hillary and, and uh, Bill Clinton. Well, glad to, glad to talk to you today. We know he was just lying, but, you know, it was just, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it just the type of humor he had. But now there are others that do that too. Can't we all try to, try to have an attitude that is positive and encourage folk, not just drag them down? We ought to refresh people because I tell you, you get flat in this world. There's so many problems. This is a problem-plagued world. Isn't it something that in this day when there's so much science and so much achievement and so, much, so many blessings that so many people are down? And I get down too sometimes. I'll admit it. But when I start spiraling down, I, I, somewhere down on that down spiral, I have to stop and say, now, wait a minute, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian. I've got to get straightened out. I've got to get my head straight. Or pretty soon I'll start taking my negative attitude into the pulpit and people don't want that. Who wants to go to here to church and be shot down? All right. Secondly, this book is about evangelism. It's about a man who was in prison, Paul, who didn't get so down and feeling sorry for himself that he just sat down and did nothing. He was busy for the Lord, busy witnessing. Philemon himself shared his faith. Verse 6 says, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The sharing of your faith. Brother Ray Rowland, that's one of his expressions. He, you know, Ray went up to uh, State College and got involved in Christian ministry there. And one thing you can say about Campus Crusade, they believe in witnessing, they believe in evangelism, they believe in telling people about Christ. And uh, we should be people who share. We have something to tell folk. We have good news. We have something people need. Share with the life you live. Share with your kindness, but also share with books, with tracts, with gospel literature, any way you can tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. The other day, and I'm not saying I'm the greatest witness. I'll be honest with you. I sometimes think I'm, I'm not, even though I'm a preacher. I'm not the greatest one-on-one -on -one witness. I'll be honest about it. But I walked up to uh, the post office and there was a man that I knew, although I didn't know him real well, he was in a truck and he looked out the window and his eyes were just pleading, I need help. I, I could see it in his eyes. And I said, that's a green light from God. Just almost spontaneously, I walked over to him and I introduced myself, I knew his name, and I said, and I called him my name, I said, you look like you're down today. You look like you need help. And he said, oh my, I'm getting ready to go for a serious operation and the doctors don't even know if I'm going to make it or not. And you know, before it was over, I was able to share with him about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I asked him if he knew the Lord and at this point, uh, he didn't know if he did. In fact, he said he didn't know the Lord. Now, that's unusual for me. I'll be honest with you. I don't go around getting people by the, by the throat and saying, are you saved? I just don't do that. I try to wait for a green light. I think that's a pretty good rule for me anyway. But any, at any rate, and then I was able to visit him later in where he was uh, uh, convalescing. But share your faith. Use common sense about it. Use prudence. Don't be pushy. Don't be arrogant. Don't be obnoxious. You know, we Christians, uh, we sometimes can put our fist in people's face. We shouldn't do that. You can be loving to anybody. Remember, whoever you're talking to, you could be in worse shape than them if it weren't for the grace of God. But especially, 
I wanted to share about how evangelism comes out in this book because Paul witnessed to Onesimus. Now, he was a, a runaway slave. Now, I know that this raises a lot of questions about the whole issue of the slave trade and all as it affected our country here and so forth. Why didn't Paul condemn slavery here? Well, there were some cultural reasons why he didn't. Let me just say this. The Bible in the spirit of the Bible... The spirit of Christianity definitely speaks against the kind of chattel slavery we had here in our country. There's no doubt about that. It was a little bit different back in those days. Uh, the, uh, the, the masters were, generally speaking, while they owned these people, they took care of them. They gave them good uh, homes and, and let them stay in their homes and, and uh, paid them well and so forth. But that's another story. But at any rate, this uh, slave, Onesimus, who was wandering around on the streets of Rome, somehow or other in the province of God, came in contact with Paul. Paul shared the gospel with him, and he was saved. And you know, one thing that happens when you're saved is you want to straighten out the wrongs that you've done. You want to straighten things out. You want to pay the debt you owe. If you've, if you've uh, committed a crime, you need to uh, take care of it. There was a man that... Uh, owned a, a big business up here in uh, the Milton area a few years ago, and he said that there was a man that made such an impression on him, an employee that he knew that he'd hired, and he, and he left and went to another business. And one day he walked into his office and he introduced himself. He said, I worked for you for about 10 years, and I stole something from your business. And I'm coming in here today to tell you I'm a Christian now. I want to straighten it out. I'm going to pay that right now. And he said, I couldn't believe it. That bit watch well, has been years and years ago. I don't, I barely remember him, but he, it made a difference in his life to become a Christian. Now, here's something else, though, that I was thinking about. And that is the fact that Paul, although incarcerated, although in prison, although in a very miserable situation, was still doing evangelism. Most of us have not ever gone to jail. In fact, I hope I, I don't ever go to jail. I'm going to do everything I can to stay out of prison. I really am. First of all, I'll lose my job. I know I will. You would not hire me if I were a jailbird. I'm sure of that. But secondly, I don't like the looks of jails. I've been in a number of them. I've never seen one I liked. At Christmas, I go up here to the uh, federal pen, you know, and you go through all these gates and they stamp your hand, you know, and then I walk through and I see all this barbed wire. And clang, down goes the gate, you know, and you look through those bars and you think, oh, I, I hope I get out of here. But I go in, you know, and, and it's a wonderful opportunity to witness, but I wouldn't want to live there. So young people, stay out of jail. If you don't remember anything else I said, just remember that. Don't do drugs. Don't get drunk. Don't get out and drive up and down the highway inebriated. Don't steal. Whatever. Paul was in jail not because he did something wrong, but because he was a gospel minister. Because at that time, the Roman culture was anti-Christian. But he was in prison, and while he was in prison, he was a witness. He was serving the Lord. Now, here's where I'm going to make an application today. No, most of us have never been to prison in the sense of being incarcerated behind bars, but we have all, watch it now, had our prisons. Stone walls are not the only thing that can put you in prison. You can be imprisoned by poverty. You can be imprisoned by divorce. You can be imprisoned by your fears. You can be imprisoned by depression. You can be imprisoned by pain. You can be in the prison of rejection. And we've all been through one of these. What is your prison? 
Now, here's my question. When you're in trouble, when you're down, when you're being afflicted, when you're, when you're poor, when you've lost your job, when you're sick, are you still serving the Lord during those times? Even though it may be difficult. Are you still trying to spread sunshine in your environment and lead others to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, it just could be that your prison is the very opportunity God's given you to show that when you're down as well as when you're up, you are trusting in the Lord. In fact, I'm sure that's one of the reasons that churches go through trials sometimes is so God will give an opportunity to the leadership to see how they react during these times. But it's true in your family. It's true in your life. You get sick. You get the bad news from the doctor. Why did that happen? Well, first of all, God's testing you to see if you'll trust Him during that. And after all, what in the world can happen to you? The worst thing can happen is you'll die. That just means you go up to the Lord. You can't lose. And we're all going to do that if Jesus tarries. We're going to either go up with Him when we're translated when Jesus comes or we're going to go uh, through the grave. It's going to be the upper taker or the undertaker one. We're not going to avoid it. We're not going to get out of this life alive. What can possibly harm a Christian? Nothing. What can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ? Write down, tell me one problem you can have that's going to separate you from Jesus Christ. I'd like to see it. Tell me one thing that's going to keep you from God loving you. Tell me one thing that's going to take away the precious blood of Christ and cleanse you from sin. Not one thing. The question is, can you use your trouble to show that you are a believer even if God has sent some trial into your life. Here's a guy who hadn't done anything wrong, but he was in jail, and yet he was still evangelizing. Now, I want to learn from that. That's important. Now, whether it's in divorce, poverty, guilt, pain, sickness, whatever, be a witness. Now, we come, though, to the third thing, and this is sort of the punchline. This book's about forgiveness. I want to tell you something. I don't know about you, but I find that for me sometimes forgiving is one of the hardest things in the world because it's human nature to harbor grudges. It's human nature. It's of the flesh, though. Let's get it straight. It's of the flesh to go around being hostile because somebody hurt you. That's just the way we are. But to be like God is to be a forgiving person. Especially to be like Jesus is to be a forgiving person. You need to close the book on some things in your past, every one of you. Someone let you down. Someone rejected you. Someone was unfair. Someone was unjust. Maybe it might have been a Christian. You need to close the book on it. You need to put it on the cross. You need to let Jesus bear that. Because if you carry that burden around long enough, it's just going to pull you down. Now, you say, well, this person didn't repent. Well, there is a, there is a special kind of forgiveness when people come and say, I'm sorry. But, you know, it's, it's easy to forgive then. But can you kind of just put behind you a hurt of someone that for some reason has not said they're sorry and maybe never will? You know as well as I do that, if, that uh, they're probably never going to come by and say they're sorry. Maybe they don't feel they did wrong. Or maybe they're just hard-hearted. But it's God-like to be forgiving. On the cross... Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Who were these people? Murderers. Betrayers. The people he'd blessed. The people he'd healed. 
the people he loved. And yet while he was hanging there with blood streaming down his legs and splashing on the soil, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He pleaded for them. He interceded. Now, Paul's saying to Philemon, Philemon, I know Onesimus has done you wrong. He stole from you. He left when he shouldn't have. I want you to take him back. I'm sending this letter to you, and I'm pleading with you as your friend and your brother in Christ, forgive him. Take him back. Isn't it wonderful to be a, a mediator sometimes and get people back together when they've fallen out? Sometimes we can't always do that. We can't always be a reconciler, but we can try. And I have a feeling that this plea was successful. I have a feeling that when Onesimus came with this letter from Paul and knocked on his door, that Philemon, that rich Christian, went out and just took him in and put his arms around him and says, Welcome back. Because he loved him. Just like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. You know, children can really hurt you. Right? Children can hurt you. If they don't do right. If they're unkind. If they forget to be thoughtful. Or if they say nasty things to you. That, that, you know, that hurts. Of course, uh, Parents can hurt children too. I know that as well. But when that prodigal came home, when that prodigal returned to his father, he didn't stand there and say, hmm, well, I just wondered if you'd ever come by. There's no indication he did that. Because he had the love of God in him and he said, son, I'm so glad you're home. We're going to have a feast. We're going to kill the fatted calf. And what did he do? He went out and got the best robe, put a ring on his finger, and had a party. Because he said, my son which was lost is found. It's great to see people come back when they've fallen away from God. And don't give up on anybody. Listen, don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on that wayward son. Don't give up on that wayward friend. Don't give up on that fallen preacher. God can change that person. God can do anything He wants to do as we pray and as we plead with Him. But now, I'm going to close with just a couple of questions. First of all, whom do you need to forgive? That's between you and God. Whom do you need to forgive? Whom do you need to close the book on? Whom do you need to take the cry to the cross and say, it's on Calvary. Let Jesus, you take care of this. I've tired, I'm tired of wearing, uh, wearing this thing around. I'm tired of these shackles on my heart. I'm, I'm tired of it. But the other thing I want to ask is, have you received the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't say, I can, I've done too much to be forgiven. Don't say, my sin's too great. There is no sin except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that cannot be forgiven. You say, well, I've committed the unpardonable sin. I rejected Jesus. That is not the unpardonable sin, rejecting Christ. Because we'd all be unforgiven if that's so, because we rejected Christ for years and years. You say, well, I resisted the Spirit. I've committed the unpardonable sin. Resisting the Holy Spirit is not the unpardonable sin. Someday I'll tell you what it is, but I'm not going to preach on that today. All sin can be forgiven. You go through the Bible and you find even the saints, the saints, the godly, fell into terrible sins. But they repented and came back to the Lord. So please, receive God's forgiveness. Walk in the light. Don't let any cloud be between you and God. That's what Calvary is all about.